Julia, it's really it's been really exciting to find the Landrace Gardening website and the course content. Um, for me, it was a fantastic thing to come across and become part of. And I'm really intrigued to know a little bit about what has inspired you and what brought you to Landrace Gardening. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about your background in farming. <clears throat> yeah, so I've been involved in agriculture for, for most of my life. Um, I've been farming full time for the last three years. Um, but before that, I was I was part of a farm where we are doing organic no-till with draft horses. And we were doing the um, roller crimper method where you grow a cover crop and then use the roller crimper, which is a sort of mechanical way to terminate the cover crop. Um, so this is a organic version of conventional no-till where they use herbicides to kill the cover crop and then plant into it. I had a lot of failures doing that. For example, I was growing a, a crop of butternut squash and the squash really didn't thrive. They were tiny. Um, they didn't grow well at all. My takeaway from that was that it was a problem with the soil and that I needed to learn how to like balance soil nutrition and really focus on, on soil. I did that for a few years. I studied with Elaine Ingham and then John Kempf, and I spent a lot of time learning how to read soil tests. Something, you know, during this process that was sort of bothering me was that this method that I was learning was less conventional, but it was still about adding a lot, spending money on soil tests. You know, John Kemp does a lot with testing and, and foliar sprays and sap testing. And when I went to Peru, it hit home a little bit more. Like most of the world doesn't have access to soil testing. They can't buy these things. And I didn't know the solution. I guess I was just, I've been searching for a way to, to farm differently. And then uh, about a year and a half ago, something happened that sort of made me change my mind. And what was that that happened that made you change your mind? So the Bionutrient Food Association, I guess it's the Bionutrient Institute now, they did three years of surveys and they collected samples. These were produce samples from all over the US. But the goal of the Bionutrient Food Association was to show that regeneratively farmed produce would be higher quality, so higher in antioxidants and phytonutrients than the grocery store conventionally farmed samples where the plants had been given synthetic nitrogen. So they had farmers and citizen scientists sending in crop from their fields and also from the grocery store. And then the really amazing thing was with those samples, they would send in their soil tests and also their practices, their farming practices. So were they doing tillage or no-till? Were they using compost, irrigation? So they got massive amounts of data and a lot of tests. And they released a report that showed that there was giant differences. So you could have a carrot, for example, that was 200 times higher in potassium than another carrot. But what they, what they couldn't prove was that farming practices affected the nutrient density of the samples. So I read these reports and I was like, it must. Everything I've learned shows that what you do should affect the bricks and the mineral content and the antioxidants of these samples. So I got my hands on the raw data and I spent a couple of weeks, this was, you know, dark COVID winter where I had nothing to do. I spent a couple of weeks looking for patterns and I learned how to do pivot tables and scatter graphs and I couldn't find patterns either. I went through these samples and I looked for things like, does the calcium content in the produce correspond to calcium in the soil? And uh, from what I've learned from John Kemp, you know, it really, it really should. So also I could look for things like, does, does the bricks of the tomato correspond to the, the nutrient levels in the crop? And that also didn't correspond. I'd, I'd learned a lot that it should. Bricks is a measurement of quality. Uh, kind of across the board, did you find that? Did you find any kind of consistencies, any patterns in the data that would indicate so, for example, a no-till system might generally produce higher levels of bricks, or is it really variable? Is it quite extreme data? Everything that I looked at, no-till, 
you know, is in greenhouses, high irrigation, there, you know, at least from that data set, there were no patterns. You know, I don't know that there are actually no patterns anywhere, but it gave me this confidence that, okay, there's a problem in what I've learned and I need to look further. And that's kind of disappointing in a way for me, because I feel like all of that information that I've learned over the last how many years that soil health is so important suddenly it's kind of like the rug's been pulled out from under you and you're questioning everything so that must have been quite a shock it was quite a shock and it was really painful because I had spent years on it yeah. but also I, I don't want to say that it's not important so soil health and and good farming practices and you know the organic no-till and the draft horses all of that is important and I believe in it. It's not like you should go around doing whatever to your soil and not worry about it. It's just that as far as nutrient density and disease resistance, it's a smaller factor than I had thought it to be. Okay, so back to that, uh, I started finding patterns. And when I sorted by color or when I sorted by variety, all of a sudden you could see that certain varieties were much, much different than other varieties. So for example, one variety of lettuce could be 10 or 20 times higher in antioxidants than another variety of lettuce. In some cases, these were on the same farms in the same soil. So that caused me to really be like, okay, I've never, this has never been a focus of, of mine. I thought that if I do foliar sprays and amend the soil properly, I will have higher bricks and then I will have higher antioxidants and all the good things. Then I was like, that's not what I'm finding. And I started reading other studies. I'd always been told, as you probably have, that the, the cause for decline over the last 75 years in our food has been a result of declining soil health. Have you heard that? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Direct, direct impact to the Green Revolution farming practices big agriculture has had a negative effect on our soil health. Right. So we should be able to get the same varieties that we've been getting the last few years um, and then do better and have higher quality produce. So all of a sudden, you know, between the bricks, it doesn't correspond to this, the calcium in the soil doesn't correspond to calcium in the plant, the soil quality and all these different farms had no pattern over nutrient density. I started reading outside of, you know, where I would have been researching before. And I started learning about other factors that affect nutrient density. And I would say that, that the biggest thing, there's a direct correlation between yield and nutrient density. If you consider, yeah, the, the green revolution has happened over the last 70 years during the decline of our, our, our food quality. But what's happened besides these bad farming practices is that breeders have been breeding for yield. Besides yield, it's shelf life, transportability, all those things that do not correspond to flavor. What, what sort of hit home was seeing that graph of, okay, higher yield means lower nutrient density. That's such a huge thing to realize and must have been quite a light bulb moment for you to have it, that realization. Yeah, because so recently I'd been consuming all this stuff about soil and mineral nutrition and, yeah. and you know, just like spent so much time. <laughs> and when you spend years of your life on something, you don't want to admit that you are wrong. <laughs> so no, nobody is talking about this in regenerative agriculture. This, this is the first time I've really come across this idea that genetics have such a huge part to play in the nutrient density of food. The focus is largely on soil health and farming practices. I've seen yeah. a study in, in nutrient density with potatoes where where the potatoes were farmed was about one third of the effect that the cultivar had on the nutrient density. So this was in a specific antioxidant. So it's like, okay, if you have two thirds that is more affected by seeds and genetics, why is this conversation not on the table? This is not information that I'm coming up with. We've known that, that breeders have been breeding for yield. So why not talk about it? Yeah. So after going through all this data, I thought, well, maybe heirlooms could be the solution because they haven't been tinkered with by definition for the last however many years that the other varieties have been changed and um, 
selected for different things. But yeah, there are other problems with heirlooms and 70 years of inbreeding or open pollination within very closely related populations is has caused them to be weak. When I, you know, when I started reading more about that, it was like, okay, heirlooms are not the answer. What is the answer? What is the answer? <laughs> what is the answer? So all of this blows wide open. What do we do? What is the answer?